very nice of him, I think. <laughs> what goes on up there, we'll never know. Yeah. Uh, see, that's very nice. I was, I'll give you a 9.95 for that. I was, you, you, no, you'd have got a perfect 10. But the fellow over here fell out of his seat and made a bad landing. <laughs> so it's not a 10 tonight. How are you? You sound great tonight? It's Friday night? This is the Tonight Show, which is on television as a public service. Uh, has to give Jim McKay time to go to the John. <laughs> Never see Jim away from that desk. That bothers me. Uh. <laughs> no, you sound good tonight. This is a, uh, a Viking One audience. How's that? Good, good, very good. <laughs> well, they're just waiting to scoop up the jokes and analyze them. <laughs> see, it says. <laughs> Same to you. <laughs> Now, you saw Friday nights, we look forward to Friday nights for many reasons, because tomorrow's Saturday, but uh, Thursday, last night, we had a dinghy group here. I've been doing the show almost 15 years. I was the first audience last night I've seen to bring their own host. <laughs> How are you, Doc? Everything is lovely. I don't... You're not cutting it anymore, huh? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Nick. Hey, Tom, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> Tommy fills in when Doc. I, I kid Tommy, um, because he's dull. <laughs> no, great musician, but Tommy's idea of a big Saturday night is to sit in the closet and play with his digital watch. <laughs> I know a lot of you are out here on vacation, and we have been giving, from time to time, nightly tips to tourists. So that you don't get ripped off in California by unscrupulous uh, merchants or whatever. And today's tip is, stay away from any wax museum where the statues seem to have a three-day growth of beard stubble. <laughs> Probably not a real wax museum. Have you seen the latest news? We have a little problem on the Viking One mission. It's been sensational. The pictures have been magnificent. But now, according to the... Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The Space Lab is having trouble with the... Uh, the what? The extender. Yeah, that probing arm yeah. that is supposed to go out and in a few days pick up some of the Martians. So the extender, that's very good. Uh, it's, it's kind of arm helper is what it is. Yes. Uh, and it may or may not scoop up any dirt samples. And uh, NASA's a little bit worried. They call a space repair expert. He said he does not make house calls and uh, would probably have to go into the shop anyway. <laughs> if, uh, if nothing else works, they figured out a sure wire, sure fire way. they're going to do, they're going to set up an astronaut to kick it. That's what they should have done in the first place. Uh, according to one scientist, it couldn't have come at a worse time to malfunction. It was the day after the warranty ran out. Which always happens. Did you know they found a candy wrapper on Mars? Yeah, they did. It said Earth Bar. <laughs> Space, the space jokes don't seem to be going too good tonight. Let's move on to the political arena and see what's happening. Uh, Jimmy Carter is back in New York after vacationing in Plains, Georgia, and he met with the leading businessmen in New York City yesterday, heads of big corporations, and, and they got along very well, Carter and the big businessmen, because they got something in common. He raises peanuts, and that's what they pay in taxes. <laughs> so that's working out pretty good. You may not have seen this in the news, but while Jimmy Carter was in New York, a mugger came up to Carter, actually shoved a gun in his ribs, and said, give me your money or your life, and Carter promised him both. <laughs> Carter's uh, running mate, Walter, or Fritz, as they call him in the Senate. Hmm. 
Walter Mondale finally settled on a personal campaign strategy. Mondale's gonna run as a candidate who most resembles Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. I just saw the news before I came down here tonight. Reagan claims, and both, and Ford now claims, that they each have enough delegates to get the nomination on the first ballot at the Republican convention. Both claim, and both of them can't have it. Uh, and President Ford, I understand today, gave strict orders to his staff that they are not to promise anything, any personal favors to any uncommitted delegate just to get their vote. As a matter of fact, the president was very adamant, adamant about today. He told one delegate right to his face. He said, it would be wrong of me to promise you any political appointment just to get your vote. He says, as a matter of fact, I shouldn't even allow you to be sitting on, sitting on my lap now. <laughs> He also said it better than I did, too. He, he got it out and got a pretty good laugh. Um, you know who's in California? Elizabeth Ray was on the news here in California last night. Brilliant girl. The IQ of a philodendron. Anyway. She held a press conference at the Beverly Hills Hotel and announced she had her the producer who's going to make this movie about her life on Capitol Hill. Can't you just wait for that? I cannot. It's the story of her, her loves and I guess her Washington experiences. The uh, movie's going to be called The Elizabeth Ray Story or Deep Typing. <laughs> Has an interesting rating. It's, the movie's going to be rated P. No one is allowed in the theater with their pants on. <laughs> <It's>, uh... <laughs> oh, she's a, she's a great intellect. She said, one well, of the reporters asked if she's going to be nude in the movie. She says, yes, possibly she would appear nude in this picture, but at least now we'll be able to see where our, our money went. <laughs> She's got a great producer. I have not met him, but he's the same man who made a movie with George Hamilton, uh, the story of Evil Knievel, and you know how big that was. Uh, in this movie, Miss Ray tries to jump over 18 congressmen. And, uh, and almost makes it. Uh, anyway, you sound like a... A good audience, and we've got it. You told them who's on tonight? Yes. We have Flip Wilson, Pat Boone, Tom Dreesen, and Dr. Lennon Smith. And along with Dr. Smith, we have two world-famous child psychologists on the show tonight. And they're going to debate the question, at what age do you break it to your child that he lives in Burbank? <laughs> Thank you just about hurt your... Uh... I just threw a pencil up in the air anyway. Boy. Good, good night tonight. Sure. It's going to be fu fun tonight. Yes, good night. I feel it. Flip hasn't been here for a while. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Incidentally, our piano player, one of the fine pianists in the entire country, really, plays so beautifully, Ross Tompkins, is going to be um, appearing this Sunday evening, this weekend, at the Concord Summer Festival in Concord, California. Ross? Yeah. Ross, did you know that? You guys want to tell Ross that's where he's going to be? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Did you? Watching the Olympics last night, which are really fantastic. Sensational. Sensational. Did you see this? The, um, they have a little series of things they do called Close Up and Personal. They do a little profile. And they did one on Princess Anne. Princess Anne. Did you see Princess Anne mm -hmm. last night? Yes, I did. We do not speak the same language. No. I don't care what they say. There's no way you're going to Princess that. Anne is a lovely lady. But I couldn't understand. You do a great it, imitation of her. You'd be Jackie Stewart. You know, he, he's like this. Yeah. Tell me, Princess Anne. Tell me, Princess Anne, when did you start uh, writing? Yes, you do. I have 
jeg så op i det i min vej i min kongen. Jeg ville få et par vejr for det der. No, I thought she was mad. Now he went and interviewed her husband. Right. Captain Mark Phillips. Yes. If you think she is bad. Right. Captain Phillips. Oh. Uh, Captain Phillips, what is the uh, the agony for the the loser? I hope I hope Queen Elizabeth left the country. I don't mean to make fun of her her in-laws, but. I thought he was physically ill. <laughs> no. Well, we'll be back, Mark. <laughs> ah, interesting. Anyway, <laughs> that'll do a lot for our international relations. The Queen has left, hasn't she? Yes. Tonight. Tonight. She's, she's leaving right tonight, right tonight my dear. <laughs> I'm getting on a plane. <laughs> Cosmopolitan magazine, which is kind of a, a kicky magazine, I guess. They go in for a lot of strange quizzes and. Uh, things that people can do, and there's an there's a article this month, I guess, called At Least Once in a Lifetime. It says, certain moments, places, food, situations are so special, we believe every Cosmo girl should savor them at one time in her life. In other words, special experiences, things you would like to do, a whim or a fantasy. Maybe only something. just once. Yeah, well, yeah, something on the spur of the moment you've always wanted to do, and they've asked the people to write in, and they looked over the list. For example, stay up all night and toast the dawn with champagne. No, you know, that's kind of romantic, yes. and people always stay up all night and come You can in. do that more than once in a lifetime. We, we have done that. Many times. We, have, we have done that. But it wasn't too romantic. No. You know, when they're taking your prince. <laughs> that's, that's not romantic, you know. Would you just roll it over there? Here's a towel. Okay. They're talking about with the one you love. Yes. With the one you love. I understand. Uh, bite into a raw but ripe just-picked ear out of corn, right out in the cornfield. Oh, yeah. Spend your whole bank account on a foreign sports car. You know, you just you mm -hmm. go bananas. Take the controls of an airplane. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be nice to know how to fly first. <laughs> Have a pedicure. Do one totally charitable act. Make supper for a Bowery bum. That's true. Read aloud to a blind person. Deposit 500 anonymous dollars into a broke friend's checking account. Go skinny dipping with your lover. Bake bread. I've done that. Going skinny dipping with your lover it's sounds like better. more fun than watching, I've done both than watching bread better. rise. Have a. <laughs> have a professional massage, I suppose, versus an unprofessional one. <laughs> Ride a, a horse bareback along the ocean. Kiss in the rain. Well, we've done that, I'm sure. Not the two of us. <laughs> I didn't mean that. Make love with all the lights on and your eyes wide open. That we've done. <laughs> and, and that's why we are where we are today. Found out it wasn't them. Uh, walk. Walk. Walk through fresh snow and listen to it crunch. You know, live alone. We've done that, too. Okay. Anyway. We've done a lot of these things. Uh, those are interesting. Those little, what issue was that? That was just... I didn't... Uh, I, didn't I, I was on vacation. I guess Cosmo I could missed that yeah. one. That's great, though. Little whims, fantasies. But look at that, all on one page. All on one page. Everything in the world you'd want to do just once. Is captured right there. That's amazing how somebody can do an article and say everything in the world you'd ever want to do one time. You are wrong, STP Brett. <laughs> <laughs> There's more? Uh, we have. How much more? We have a few little fantasies and goodies here. I don't think that they covered. For example, just once in a lifetime, wear your brassiere on the outside. <laughs> yeah. Put on the television set and dance naked in front of Walter Cronkite. <laughs> You know, throw up on the supersonic Concorde on the way to Paris. Oh. Hang glide in the nude over Police Chief Davis's house. <laughs> oh. 
Go on a tour of Universal Studios and tell Alfred Hitchcock to shut up. <laughs> Take a horse to church. <laughs> Have an affair in the on-deck circle at Yankee Stadium. <laughs> See if you can hold a hamburger in your cleavage. <laughs> Get into a bathtub of hot jello, slice a banana, wait until it sets, and eat your way out with a spoon. <laughs> Join the Teamsters Union and blow the pension fund. <laughs> a little humor there. I love sweetheart. Go through Lion Country Safari with chopped liver on your shoes. Spend a day at Doris Day's house and get treated like a dog. <laughs> Pose nude for the centerfold of Playboy and show the world what most people look like. <laughs> Spike your preparation H with Snappy Tom. <laughs> Just a few Okay, we will be back. This should be a fascinating show tonight. We're going to take a brief intermission. We will be back right after this for more fun and games. One of the... Uh... Yes, that's it. One of the great joys of doing this show is... Uh bringing new comedians to television. Our staff says they found another very humorous gentleman, and I hope you'll make him feel at home at his first appearance on The Tonight Show. Would you welcome my first guest of the evening, ladies and gentlemen? You know, I think back with great fondness to the fact that I did have my first national exposure on American television here on The Tonight Show. Yeah, my first shot. That was 1965, John. Now I'm back tonight, folks, to ask for a second chance. <laughs> you know, they say you should always be nice to the people you meet on the way up because you're running into those same people coming back. <laughs> you know, I didn't accept it. I heard it was a word of Colonel Parker that said, you don't have to be nice to the people going up if you don't intend to come back. <laughs> you know? I didn't intend to come back, folks, but I am. I'm working on my comeback. And it's particularly difficult for me because it's, it's hard to come back when you haven't left. <laughs> but I'm working on it in case I should leave. I want you to know that I'm coming back and I'd like for you to hold a place for me. Oh, get on with the jokes. Oh, I was thinking tonight, I couldn't wait to ask the uh, child psychologist coming on later about the issue between kids and guns. I, too, am a parent, folks. And I think that we should be very conscious of it when we make promises to kids that we don't intend to keep. I heard an incident a few days ago. A kid came to his father and said, Daddy, nice little kid. Live with his mother and father. You know, he liked them. <laughs> Mm, I have to remember that gonna get a laugh there. <laughs> kid said, Daddy, can I have a gun? And his father said, No. The kid said, But it's my birthday. His father said, You still can't have a gun. The kid said, But last year you told me next year when my birthday came, I could have a gun. His father said, Well, you're not gonna get a gun. The kid was crying. He went to his mother. She loved him too. <laughs> and the kid said, Mommy, can I have a gun? Daddy said, he, Last year I could. Then this year he said, No. And his father overheard it. And he snatched that kid in the collar. He said, you're not going to get a gun. You understand that? I guess it, but you promised. He said, I don't care. He said, you're not going to get a gun. Said, as long as I'm running this house, you're not going to get a gun. And the kid said, if I get my hands on a gun, you're not going to be running this house too much longer. <laughs> so if you make a promise to a kid, keep it. You know, I heard of another incident where the father was too supportive of his kid's conduct with a gun. He'd bought his kid a gun, the kid wanted one. 
And the next door neighbor came over, he knocked on the door, and he said, I want to speak to you. The father said, what is it? This guy really loved his kid. He said, your kid killed one of my chickens with his gun. His father said, he killed, that's right. He said, he killed my chicken with his gun. His father said, impossible, we got that's a toy gun. He said, that's a toy gun. He said, let me see it. And the father took it to him, said, hey, it's a rifle. He said, well, how do you kill a chicken with a rifle? The guy took it by the barrel and said, like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's a very thin line between whether you should let the kid have the gun or not. So I want to discuss it with child psychologists when they come out here. But I really had in mind coming out here tonight, folks, I want to do some Reverend Leroy. I haven't received, really, really, you know? Because, you know, you know, I think that myself, more than any other comic, has a bigger chain of communication between the ministers around this country. You know, ministers all over this country are writing to me constantly, keeping me in touch, because they, we, they know that we're all working for the same executive. <laughs> I remember Reverend Leroy, the first time I saw him perform. Well, I call it a performance. It was a little church, and Reverend Leroy came, had just come into town. And he'd been there coming into the church three or four months now. And he, he spoke to the congregation from the bottom of his heart. When I was right there in the audience, folks. It's real. I remember it as though it were yesterday. He spoke to the congregation. He said, brothers and sisters, he said, I have come to this town to build the tabernacle, to pay tribute. He said, and I'm sure that all of you there, he said, you, you, and you, and you, and her, and him. <laughs> he said, I'm sure that all of you know that I did not come to town first class on a 747. That I did not come to town in a long train of limousines. Said that I did not come in the comfortable new coaches of the people that say leave the driving to us. Said <laughs> I hitchhiked into this town. And many of you remember me because you passed me on the highway. <laughs> He said, friends, I've come here and tried to build something. He said, and I'm sure that all of you, as I do, know that we must progress. We must progress. And the congregation yelled, let's progress, Rev. Let's progress. He said, well, if this church is going to progress, first, it's got to crawl. This church must crawl. And the congregation yelled, let it crawl, Rev. <laughs> let it crawl. Rev said, and after this church is crawled, it must stand up. This church must stand up and walk. And the congregation yelled, make it walk, Rev. Make it walk. Rev said, and after this church has walked, this church must run. <laughs> The congregation yelled, make it run, Rev! Make it run! Rev said, and for this church to run, it's gonna take money. And the congregation yelled, let it crawl, Rev! <laughs> I love those stories. Let me take a break, and then I'm going to see if I can talk into doing one story you did a long time ago. I'll tell you what it is in a second. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're talking with Flip Wilson. Thanks for dropping by tonight. Pat Boone, sure, Tom Dries, and Dr. Lyndon Smith. And um, I should point out, occasionally on this show, um, we book somebody, and sometimes they don't appear. They get bumped, as you well know. Oh, uh, yes, I, I, I heard you do a routine once after you'd been on the show and you became a hit. It was some benefit or one of those friars yeah, things. Yeah. He went through a routine. He was booked on this show, what was it, five? I got bumped five. I hold the record five for Five times. In a row. 
Nobody heard a flip, and we booked him one night, and the show ran long. Which also gave me the distinction of being the highest paid guest. That's right. <laughs> and he got paid every night five That's times right. he didn't go on. So if some young that comedian is watching and doesn't get on, look yeah. what happened. That's right. And that was uh, 1965. Yeah. Sheesh. That's incredible. That really is incredible. Yeah, but I've had a big cookie. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know that uh, lately. Oh, did you mention that next month? I'm gonna be, yeah, you're gonna be, be, yes, I am. You're gonna guest be hosting here, here for next month. Great. Having a party for a week next month. A little party? Yeah, we're gonna have a party all week. Uh, I spoke to some very. See, they even started a party already. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> Can't you wait till August? Either that or they got the arm working on the biking probe. Yeah. One of the two is now getting the soil. Um, I, the, the story I ask you to tell, you, you, you'd say, hey, that Well, was... there, there are a lot of stories that I used to do that I don't do anymore, John, because but I But people feel... got to come to you and say, hey. Yes, I get a lot of requests, uh, but I feel that the, the caliber of story that the American public once now is different from the stories of that time. Uh -huh. At that time, we were more confused and we needed stronger humor. You know? Yes. But there were some funny stories, though. Yeah. Do one of those. There, there, there was one that, uh, that's a funny story. I just don't, <laughs> just don't do it anymore. Because now, at the time, the story would have been hip, but now to do a story like that is bad taste because people one. have you grown gotta, you gotta beyond that. It's a funny story. <laughs> I never told you it. I don't think so. Well, it's the story about the prejudice parrot? No, no, no. no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to do it. Yeah. And a few years ago, I would have done it. Well, watch. Oh, oh, now? Do it tonight. Okay. I haven't heard it. Okay. <laughs> I haven't heard it. There was this uh, fellow on the parrot. It's still doing the dip, you must understand, <laughs> so it makes no difference. Right? This fellow on the parrot. He got in a little financial difficulty. He goes to the pawn shop and he says, I want to sell this parrot. And uh, the proprietor says, okay. Then the guy says, look, uh, I got to tell you, this parrot is prejudiced. I've had him for years and he doesn't like black people. He said, so when you sell the parrot, be sure that uh, you try not to sell it to a black person. If you do, explain to them the parrot's background. <laughs> because the parrot doesn't like black people. And I said, okay, well, I'll keep that in mind and I'll make sure that I convey that to the possible owner. <laughs> <laughs> and about five minutes later, so a brother walked in the shop there, said, you got any parrots? <laughs> 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 and uh, the fellow said, yes, we do have one parrot. Said, uh, fella, he said, but before I sell them to you, said, I'd like to take a moment to run down the parrot's history to you. <laughs> the fellow said, can the parrot talk? <laughs> the man said, yes. He said, well, let him run it down himself. <laughs> said, uh, I'm going to just take the bird home, and me and the bird will get in some conversation. We'll rap, and we'll find out what we ought to know about each other. He said, how much you want for the bird? <laughs> so the guy gave him $30. You know, he took the bird home. Put the bird in the cage, and he's sitting there looking at the bird. He said, Polly, want a cracker? The bird kind of turned around on his perch and rolled his eyes at his old brother. You know, so brother went around outside the cage. He said, probably want a cracker. <laughs> the parrot turned back around on the perch and he crossed his little parrot knees. <laughs> you know? <laughs> looked back over his shoulder and winked at the soul brother. So brother went around outside the cage and said, probably want a cracker. The parrot said, you want a watermelon? <laughs> Don't get laughs anymore, no. as you can tell. <laughs> I hadn't heard that. Oh, you know the one I was talking about was the lady with the ugly baby, but you forgot. I, I won't push you on that. <laughs> He's, Freddie told me you were doing a. You've already done it, the, the Bionic? Oh, an episode yeah, in the Bionic yeah, six Man? Six million dollar man. Six million dollars. I had to. Yeah. I had to. My kids are such a big fans of the show. Uh, and. Uh, I guess that if you were really somebody, you'd be on the Bionic Man. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just finished a segment on the Bionic Man, and I played a, a comic who was 
very similar in appearance to the prime minister of an African country, which wasn't difficult to cast. <laughs> <laughs> was it fun? You know, oh, Did it was fun. It? it was fun, and I had to sneak in, in disguise, and in one disguise I was a nun, you know? And uh, it was fun. It was, yeah, it was crazy. Fun. How's your, your, how's your golf? You got, you got oh, a golf, golf tournament out of Let me tell you, I just got, I got to take a moment to thank yeah. Jack Nicholas. I played with Jack at the opening of his new course. You play with the biggies now. Oh, huh? oh, oh. <laughs> Anybody look impressed? <clears throat> uh, I played with Jack at his news course, and he sent me, just sent me a set of clubs. Well, let me tell you. He said he would send me a set of the new clubs that he designed. Yeah. Okay. At the time, I was involved in an auction, and we had a glove there that Nicholas had signed, and we were auctioning it off. I was handling the bidding. So I started the bidding at $10 for the glove and stayed there. So I owned the glove, which was great. So I go home and I sold the glove to my kid for $12. Good thing. He's a big Jack Nicholas fan. <clears throat> so the kid was leaving town to visit his mother for a couple of weeks, so I stole the glove back. So I've been playing with the glove, and then I got home the first day after I played with the glove, and uh, there was this set of clubs. The jacket sent me, it arrived that day. The glove was an omen. So I've been playing my best ever with that Nicholas glove and those clubs. Mm. Now, I don't know if it's the glove <laughs> or the clubs. <laughs> I won't know until my kid gets back. <laughs> <laughs> he takes the glove off, he the takes game the glove back. Apart. <laughs> then I'll know. But I've been having a lot of fun. They just super. Well, really? you've been traveling, you usually get out sometimes and just... Yeah. <laughs> I get out. I, I travel and... probably uh, two weeks a month. I, uh, I'm national chairman of the American Cancer Society. Right. And in that capacity, uh, I travel a couple of times a month to different affairs, and we uh, raise money for it. And it averages about $35,000 each time I make a trip. So uh, we've been humming right along here all year. Yeah. What's, what's the week? I think I got it down there. August. You're going to be here the 23rd 23rd through, through the 27th, right? That's right. We're going to have some great people I've spoken to. Uh, just to name drop a little. Just I spoke to right? Al Green and Stevie Wonder. Uh, uh, and I want to have Dodie Goodman. Dodie Goodman and I had some great moments on this show. Yeah. And George Brothers, who I like very, very much. And we're going to have some... To solve just, all your yes, problems. Yes, you know, George is my buddy. Yeah. Stevie Wonder has got to be one of the most yeah. talented songwriters yeah. and performers yeah. in the field. Yeah. So I'd like to write a few of his songs. <laughs> yeah. We're going to have a good one. Yeah. Where are you heading tonight? I know you can't stay, but where are you heading tonight? You got something on special? Yes, I'm going to play some night golf. <laughs> they, night golf. <laughs> they have a new course open by the airport where they just installed night lights. And b but before I got these Nicholas clubs, I played my best game at night. Because what I would do is I would hit, and my next hit would be the first ball I reached. <laughs> and I parred more holes. <laughs> <laughs> whosoever it was. You yes, whosoever it was, I hit it. <laughs> I didn't have two balls the same in 18 holes. <laughs> hey, thanks for coming back tonight. Okay, really, my it's pleasure. great to see you, and we'll see, see you August the okay. 25th. Thank you, sir. I love his body rhythm when he tells stories. Yeah. I mean, he yeah. gets, uh-huh. <laughs> Polly want to crack oh, I haven't heard him do that. Did you know that? Have you heard him do that I've heard story before? I'm not, I've heard the story. Oh, I haven't heard I him do it. I couldn't believe it. We have a message from Johnson's, makers of fine products to help care for your home, and then Pat Boone will join us. <laughs> Pat Boone is with us tonight. He is, uh... This you may find hard to believe, but Pat Boone is an expectant grandfather. Mm. But that I cannot quite, yeah. uh, I cannot cope with that. That's mm. like somebody would tell me that Annette Funicello is in the motion picture country home. Uh, <laughs> being fed intravenously. I... <laughs> Time passes so swiftly, <laughs> doesn't it? Yes. Uh, I don't think that happens till November, though, and... Uh, this Sunday at the Worlds of Fun Amusement Park in Kansas City, Pat will be working. And the next Sunday, July the 29th, the entire Boone family opens at uh, Knott's Berry Farm out here in Southern California. Would you welcome Mr. Pat Boone? <laughs> we talked about this the last time, and I still find it remarkable with that kisser of yours, that you're going to be a grandfather. Yes. I mean, I guess <laughs> the time had to come, and looks like it's upon us now. Yeah. The thing is, I can't. I'm looking at you guys, yeah. and I mean, here we are, and I'm going to be the first grandfather. <laughs> as far as we know. Hard to believe. Yeah. 
No, I, I, have, no, I have no grandchildren. No. But, but you have prematurely gray hair and... Uh... No, it's not premature. I got it when I was supposed to get it. Yeah, oh. People always say that. People always say that. No, my father, it is... You see, see how this goes across in the front? Isn't yeah, that funny? I noticed that. People yeah. thought that I was streaking this with something. Like I was taking some of that stuff that women use to put streaks in. Yeah. I don't know why I don't use anything. This doesn't get dark, and this lays I across you've there. I frightened by a skunk. <laughs> no, I stood under a tall cow one day. <laughs> the only thing I'd come up with it was, was tight. <laughs> but that, that's just the way it is. Yeah. I don't know whether to make it all white or to put some stuff in it. I think you should leave it like it is. There's nobody on TV like you. <laughs> just like that. I'll leave it. Nobody well, believes that about it being natural, but just keep it like it know is. It. No, my dad was, uh, was gray very early. Lots of people, you know, uh, to be 60 or 65 and still have dark hair. Yeah. And Ed's not going to get really gray hair because no. his hair is light to begin with. Right. See, my hair was very black, and so when you do get it, what am I apologizing for? <laughs> what is this? It's there. Well, I, I'm not ready to be a grandfather, but it's just happening. I, I wasn't ready to be a father. Look, you, know, you your daughter you. Isn't, can't be any older than you were when you and Shirley had your first child. No, she is. She she's is. Older. She's older. Yeah, she's going to be, uh, she'll be 21, and by the time we were 21, we had two, including yeah. her. Mm -hmm. So uh, she and I are both expecting. She's <laughs> expecting a baby. I'm expecting a boy. <laughs> Did you ever notice when people say, hey, I'm a grandfather, people applaud like you have done? I mean, you, <laughs> you know, like, I had very congratu little to do with it. congratulations. In fact, it you know. was over all my protests. Yeah. I forbade them to, to even fool around for the first couple of years. And they are doing me the immense good favor of having waited a year. Well, that's nice. Did but you read about that? I made a remark about it the other night about that tribe they found in New Guinea. It was in the papers, the, the Dani tribe, that when they get married, they do not consummate the marriage until oh, two yeah. years after they've been married. Then after the birth of their first child, they do not have sexual intercourse again for five years. Yeah. And anthropologists are trying to figure out why they have no interest, apparently, very little interest in sex. But they seem to be happy as clams. And... <laughs> they have uh, very bad skin problems. Uh, yes, right. They spend a lot of time under the waterfall. <laughs> they have a very large waterfall in the Danny tribe, and it's very crowded there. But, uh... No, it is interesting. Anthropologists are trying to figure out why. That seems to be one of the, what they say, uh, inborn Maybe it's not it's an It's not a very big trait. tribe either, is it? And getting, getting smaller, getting smaller. The tribe next door is growing like <laughs> crazy. <laughs> well, Nani, they're light cat sleepers. Cat they, uh... yeah. <laughs> Maybe we can get one of those anthropologists on some night to, to, and talk about that can tribe. explain that. Can yeah. explain that, what they, what they found out. It's not natural. No, they don't. No, they say that's not true. That's what that's they say not it is an, That's not an instinctive drive. The sexual drive is not an instinctive what? drive. What? That's what they say. You mean we're all weirdos? No. <laughs> it's a learned thing. As you, as, you, as you are exposed to it or you read about I, it. I, I don't believe that. Good. Well, that's, I, well uh, that's what I have read. <laughs> well, we have Dr. Lennon Smith coming out. Yeah, he I might think know. He'll, he'll dispel that in a uh, hurry. Maybe we'll find out if ch children have that natural drive or whether that's a, a learned experience. Mm. I, uh, I, I learned mine. <laughs> Not well, I might add, either. <laughs> it's only, yes, Fred, I'm going to do this. What? Oh, I want to tell you something about that when you come back. What, about what? About what we were just talking sure. about. Sure. There's only one place you find the wishbone name on fine salad dressings. We have Tom Dreesen who will join us in a while, and Dr. Lennon Smith, who was a child doctor. I don't mean he's a child, little child, and a doctor. We're <laughs> child doctor. We still do that all the time. Um, what else is happening with you besides... Have you been watching the Olympics? Oh, yeah. Oh, who hasn't? I guess wow. everybody's been watching. I... And it's, uh, it's tremendous. I wish I'm Howard thrilled. Purcell would learn that when something is on television, you can also see it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has told Purcell. There's the screen there. There are two fighters in the ring. <laughs> he talks right through everything. I like Howard, but uh, oh yeah, there's a, there's a picture there. You can see that. I was thinking about the, these these nations that uh, unfortunately had to withdraw 
for various reasons. And the, I know who's going to have the last laugh because I don't know if Howard has mentioned this, but on the back of every one of those medals, it says, Made in Taiwan. <laughs> That's what I think I thought the reason they split they saw Cosell and they didn't want to integrate that badly. <laughs> and, and, uh, no, Howard, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you, you, you're a you're a good athlete though. Well, Used to yeah, I love sports, sports and I stay active and I really think that I'm I'm I think I'm better at most sports and most everything than I was uh, 15 or 20 years ago. Is that just possible? because I stay at it, yeah. I keep doing it and everything. And most people think the... you, you most people think you peak, you know, at a certain age. And then from then on, you're into that final glide path. Yeah. No, I haven't started peaking yet. But I uh, was, <laughs> I was in, in I can remember Dublin. when I peaked. It was yeah. uh, 48, <laughs> Thursday afternoon, about 3.30. <laughs> peaking from then on. I'm sorry. You were in Dublin? In Dublin, and I was there to do a movie, and this was about eight or ten years ago. And uh, athlete, uh, performers, that is, entertainers, get to be in various kinds of athletic things. We usually make fools of ourselves, and people, I think, enjoy that, including other performers. Um, but I was in Ireland to do a movie, and they had this AAU track meet. And I'd never run track. I love to watch it, but I just never... I played baseball, football, right. basketball, tennis, but not track. And I was out in the infield of the, of the John F. Kennedy Stadium over there, and the, the track coach said, uh, just idly, you know, just sort of joking, we ought to come back tomorrow night, and and run with us in the 440 relay because uh, we're minus one dash man. I said, really? And I could, he dropped the subject and I, I brought it up again and I said, you know, I played basketball and I run a lot. Uh, are you kidding? Are you minus a man? He says, yeah, but you'd have to train for it. And I kept bringing it up till finally he said, look, if you want to do it. The 440 uh, relay. 440 that means relay. you run 110, 110 yards. And, uh, and he said, I'll ask the Irish team. He said, it won't be official, but if they want to do it and you want to run, we'll put you in. So I said, yeah, let's do it. Well, it sounded like a lark. It would be fun, and they decided I would run anchor because the U.S. had three very fast uh, dash men and then me, and they figured they'd make, put me last. Maybe I could come home with the baton. And the Irish team agreed, but then they got to thinking, gee, what if we get beat by three track men and a singer? <laughs> <laughs> so they put in Noel Carroll, who was at Stanford, I believe, and uh, he was Irish, and he was running on their team and going for a couple of world records that night, and they put him in anchor against me. Now, I wanted out, but they had the TV crews, and they had a big crowd, and there was no way out. And so we practiced uh, passing the baton. Right. And there's several ways. The easy way, of course, is just to look back, and that's slower. The fastest way, and we decided that's the way we better go for, but it's also the riskiest way, is to put your thumb on your hip, and, and when the guy enters this certain area, the guy that's going to hand you the baton, you start running, and you just have your hand like this, and he, he flies it behind you, throws it in, and when you feel it, then you go. Now, if you right. miss... You know, if you miscalculate or something, then you drop the baton and the race is over. We did it that way, and I, the race started. The first American dash man built about a three-yard lead. I'm standing there, just shaking in my boots. Noel Carroll standing back behind me, very cool. The second uh, dash man added another two or three yards, about six-yard lead. The third man, now he's approaching me. Turned out later that when he handed me the baton, I had an 11-yard lead. And I started running. I rounded that turn, which is the shortest part, and I was flying. I was thinking, man, nobody in the world could catch me. And I got about a third of the way there, and I knew I was running just as fast, but I wasn't getting there uh, quite as readily. And now I, I hear thump, thump, thump. This is Noel Carroll, and I'm, my feet are going tch, just like Flip was a while ago. With, and running, I mean running. And I hear thump, 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 these long, <laughs> slow strides, but I can tell he's gaining on me, and I... When I got to the finish line, my feet were way out in front of me, and that's not very good form. Uh, I was way back like this. I, I ran in faster than I had any right to run. I passed the, I broke the tape one half stride ahead of Noel Carroll, which was an amazing thing. But then I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop running. I never realized. My legs were like rubber, and I knew that if I stopped, I was going to fall down. And I had to run about another 30 yards before I could just sort of <laughs> post hey, that's, to a stop. that's not bad, though. I did what? win, and it was a huge thrill and a, and a fluke, uh, just a fluke. You but think of going in the track right No, I gave it up. I quit a winner. The thing is, dude, that's just pack it in and say, yeah, well, I won, it. and I won, that's, that's it. it. Yeah, I got this game licked. Yeah, that's a great story. <laughs> we'll do this. We're going to come right back. We have Tom Dreesen with us and Dr. Lennon Smith. And here's it. Tom Dreesen is with us tonight. Tom is, uh, 
Tom's a bright young comedian. He was supposed to be with us uh, last week. We were preempted by the Democratic Convention. And August the 3rd, he opens at the Comedy Store South in San Diego. And on the 22nd of August, he'll be uh, starting a 10-day engagement at uh, Harris Arena with Bobby Gentry. Will you welcome Tom Dreesen? Tom. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I was really supposed to be on this show a long time ago, but uh, as things worked out, uh, they ran out of time, and they rescheduled me for another date, and then they ran out of time on that date, and then they ran out of time on that date, and uh, anyhow, I'm here tonight, so I'd like to do for you some of the material I planned to do the first time I was supposed to be on this show a long time ago. A lot of people in the country today have been complaining about President Lincoln. <laughs> no, I guess that wasn't that long ago. But President Lincoln and I have a lot in common. Uh, for an example, he was raised in Illinois, and I was raised in Illinois. And uh, thank you, and you were raised in Illinois. I just got back from working there in Chicago Heights, Illinois, which is an interesting town. 55,000 Italian Catholics. Three families. <laughs> and one obstetrician, the most overworked man in America. Babies are being born so fast in that town, he didn't have time for surgical gloves. He uses a catcher's mitt. <laughs> but I like large families because I came from a large family. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had eight brothers and sisters, and we were very close. Five of us used to sleep in one bed. Three of those wet the bed. <laughs> the other two turned out to be great swimmers. <laughs> Now, I didn't mind coming from a large family, except for one thing, hand-me-downs. See, I had an older sister. <laughs> you know, it's like going to school and you and the teacher have on the same dress. <laughs> and he was a lot madder than I was. <laughs> Another problem with a large family, if, if you have a little sister, it seems that you have to take her everywhere you go. I finally put a stop to that. I was on the way home from school one night, had my little sister with me, 15 guys with black leather jackets come walking toward us. You could actually feel the fear building up. I don't know what they were afraid of. I wasn't going to hurt them. <laughs> one of them spoke. I figured he was the toughest one because he had concrete on his breath. <laughs> he said, hey, creep. I always wondered how he knew my name. He said, hey, creep, who you got with you? I said, oh, that's my little sister. If you let me go, you can have her. <laughs> the largest family in my neighborhood was a Barducci family. They had 17 kids. Now, you know a family's got too many kids when they buy a dog and first day they pet it to death. <laughs> 17 kids. Mrs. Barducci was an expert at cooking things like stuffed spam. <laughs> My favorite Barducci was Melvin Barducci. The reason I like Melvin, he had the dirtiest mind of any kid in the neighborhood. Melvin used to get the filthiest thoughts. He once went to confession, the priest quit and started writing short stories for Playboy. <laughs> Catholic school was a lot of fun. In fifth grade, we were making our confirmation, and the nun said you have to have a sponsor. A sponsor is an older brother or an uncle who goes to church with you. Melvin went home and told his mom and dad he had to have a sponsor. They sent him to church with a white suit and a sign on the back, Rocky's Pizza. <laughs> you <laughs> You know what's good about going to Catholic school if you're a poor kid? They dress all the children alike, so you're not supposed to know who's rich and who's poor. But rich kids have a way of letting you know they're rich. The girls come to school wearing a solid gold crucifix. Actual size. <laughs> and in first grade, the boys pay for their milk with master charge. <laughs> Here in California, all the rich kids go to one school. It's in Beverly Hills, Our Lady of the Dow Jones Averages. <laughs> What a bunch of snobs. The school mascot's a mink. <laughs> Our school mascot, when I was a kid, was a, a junkyard dog. The really a genuine junkyard dog. I don't know if you've ever seen any, but they're easy to spot. When you walk into a junkyard, they're always chained to a 53 Pontiac. <laughs> and no matter who comes in, they manage to pull that car 30 yards and bite him. <laughs> then the owner always comes out of that little shack. Oh, get down, Fluffy. <laughs> My wife and I got a dog recently. We didn't buy the dog. We got him from the animal welfare, because we figure if you can't have one naturally, you should adopt one. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I was trying to teach the dog some tricks. I don't know if you've ever done that before, but it's not easy to teach a dog tricks. So I got this red rubber ball, and every day for hours I'd throw the ball, then I'd go after it and bring it back in my mouth. I finally taught the dog to say, attaboy, attaboy. <laughs> Stuff, Tom. Thank you. Thank hey, you. You did get bumped a couple of times on this show, didn't you? The first time I did the show, I was bumped four times. <laughs> oh, I think Flip does hold a record with he five. Record yeah. with five, and I think David Steinberg has a five too. Yeah, but it I... is murderous to sit back there and get ready to do a show and have your material in mind, and you get kind of all charged up in the rhythm, and all of a sudden you're not going on. Did you run out in the streets and just do it for somebody passing by because you, <laughs> it's like, you know, you got to do it and get it out and just. I tell you what, the hardest part for me was back in Harvey. I'm from Harvey, Illinois, yeah. a suburb on the south side of Chicago, and the whole town kept watching the show, and I was bumped and bumped again and bumped again. And You call uh, your mother, folks usually. Oh, say, yeah. Hey, I'm on t national television tonight, and you don't show, and she thinks <laughs> you're lying. I know. The, my poor mother, uh, she was at a grocery store, and some lady said to her, uh, tell me, when is your son ever going to be on The Tonight Show? And she said, I don't know. He keeps getting dumped. Dumped? <laughs> <laughs> Showbiz already. We'll, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Doctor, we do little games like that here. Dr. Lennon Smith. Dr. Lennon Smith will be here to explain why we're doing this. That's what children do, right? They throw things at each other. Hey, you got his eye. We never grow up, you see. Uh, Dr. Lennon Smith is a frequent visitor to this show, and his current book is called Improving Your Child's Behavior Chemistry and a New Way to Raise Happier Children into Adulthood. Would you welcome baby doctor, little teeny doctor, Dr. Lennon Smith. <laughs> Just in time, Doctor. I need to uh, yeah. straighten some things out. Uh, uh, hey, you know, I have yeah. been on shows before, and we've had uh, discussions about milk. And uh, in a way, he's right, because right. milk is an important thing. Uh, but uh, I found out recently, and I want maybe people could send you letters mm -hmm. <laughs> to answer this. And uh, uh, something, somebody said to me, every farmer knows that if you take milk from the cow and give it, uh, and you pasteurize it, and then give it to the calf, the calf will die in six weeks. That pasteurization does something to some enzyme or some hormone or something in the milk. And what the, a human being can drink the, uh, the Apparently, milk. but uh, we die too, but it may take us longer to do this. <laughs> no, no, I don't think no, it I don't. <laughs> the, the point is that uh, I've had people now tell me that, uh, that their child seems to be allergic to milk, but at least that's the milk in the store, but they get raw milk and the child is not allergic. And I thought, well, it's because they're using Guernsey milk in one from the that's store and they're using Jersey milk someplace else. So I, I don't know, there's, there's got to be an answer. So maybe we can take a poll. And well, have people send. <laughs> I really don't know. Well, that's that's one little thing I found. And another interesting thing I've been into is a, a dentist. Or I gave a talk at a dental group and, uh, and in Spokane, Washington, and they were Smith. Tell them about the liquid calories. I said, What are liquid calories? He said, Those are calories that people are drinking, and they're getting their food from juices and liquid, and they're not chewing, and so it results in and. Uh, it's a Princess Anne's problem, and you... <laughs> that's, and that's maybe what happens to them. So we've got to... So you uh, should have some bulk in your yes, diet. Yes, something get the chew. kid an orange instead of the orange juice. Give right. him an apple instead of the apple juice. Uh, where Mother Nature didn't make juice coming out of the trees. <laughs> so sometimes all these quick... <laughs> uh -huh, so all these quick snacks for, for calories sometimes don't give the body the bulk you really need. That's also right. There's a, there's a thing called Wolf's Law, that if you don't exercise a certain part of the body, it may atrophy. Now, you may uh, uh -oh. take that. <laughs> That's, I mean, about the jaw. Or, you know, if you just put your arm in a sling, it'll waste weight. If you lie in bed too long, why, these muscles will waste away. So they're all, we've got to get going. So use your muscles so they don't atrophy. Yeah. You, you talk a lot, and so your talking muscles are very good. And you should keep on talking. Once you stop, then your the jaw falls off. And I... <laughs> like, right. like that. Like yeah. that. So we're finding out a lot of things, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, the the things that we we were taught any of these things in medical school, and like uh, crowded teeth, you know, the the those underslung jaw and the, and the teeth all crowded together. Uh, we thought, well, what's well, a mixing of the races? It's mongrelization because mm -hmm. our parents are all mixed up, and and uh, we don't have the right kind of parents. But it's not that. It's not that. It's at all. nutrition. 
and uh, they dug up skulls from you know old times, and they found that the perfect arch and nice form teeth and the no cavities in these teeth because they had something to yeah that they chew it and they didn't have the sugar and the white flour. So oh. somehow when if Carter gets in, well, we'll all be into the peanut thing. He has very good that, teeth. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So peanuts maybe, are good for you, aren't they? Yeah, generally. maybe it helps your teeth and. And yeah. he has a good job. And it also has something to do with allergies, and the nose is uh, bigger, and the, the whole face is a little wider. Because you eat peanuts? The nose is bigger? <laughs> yes, I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, well, I, I don't put know. The I don't no, I don't know. But it's, uh, there's, there's got to be some changes. And yeah. I think that uh, people watching the show right now, if they, if they want to get out of bed tomorrow morning, would get, go up and get some peanuts or peanut butter or something, and they'd be able to rise out of bed better in the morning. It seems to peanut make a difference. Peanut butter is very highly nutritious, is it not? It seems to be. But, uh, of course, if you eat a lot, you can get fat with, like you can with anything. But it's, it's, it's better than other snacks that, uh, that people Why is it that people, eat? certain people, can eat anything and do not gain weight? For example, I could eat two jars of peanut butter a day, and I would not physically gain weight. You might uh, burn it up faster in some strange way. Uh, it has a lot to do... <laughs> They, they found out not, that there's something I didn't know until yeah. recently that the brain is a, is a very busy organ. The brain, a fourth of our blood. It's my busiest brain. organ. I know that. <laughs> yeah. it's, it can it can cut off. Wolf, Wolf's Law got the other one a long time ago. <laughs> uh, we have to do this first, and we'll be back. <laughs> Did we ever discuss uh, on the job spanking or hitting a child? You still have two almost opposite camps on this. A lot of people say you cannot hit a child because there's no way to train them. Other people say a, a good uh, rod once in a while is effective. Uh, is there any hard and fast rule on I that? I suppose it has a lot to do with the way you were reared. And if you're comfortable, because your parents were, were spanking you a lot. I remember then... getting spanked once or twice, but not yeah. on, any, on any regular basis whatsoever. No. Then, then you might do that because it's something you observe. I, I think it's the same thing with so many things that, uh, that uh, people find that uh, you're, you're comfortable with a lifestyle, whether it's good or bad in a home. Right. So you tend to perpetuate that, just like the battered child will often grow up to be the battering yeah. parent. But is there any data on whether it, it, it works as an effective deterrent for behavior? Uh, they, it's just like the capital punishment doesn't seem to work. I think the right. same thing happens here. And, uh, it, it, but there's, like everything else in the human scene, there, there are situations where it's maybe necessary. But if it's a lifestyle, then that's, uh, uh, that's we'll carry detrimental. You know, that'll hurt the personality. Yeah. So everybody has a little... I was going to say, I happen to have access to some expert information. <laughs> As a daddy, I had to look it up. I mean, I did look it up in the Bible to find out what the Bible said about Spanking. The Bible says oh, a lot of spankings. Yeah. In fact, yeah, it's all right pro spanking in the Bible. Yeah. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, if you or Proverbs, a number of times in a number of ways that if you beat, they use the word beat in the King James Bible. If you beat your child, you won't hurt him. But if you don't, he'll be an embarrassment to his parents. That's from Solomon. Yeah, but they used to say in the old days it was all right to beat wives. I mean, women were chattels, and uh, but that's not so the you Bible. beat them, they kept them in line. So that doesn't necessarily... I'm just quoting from the Bible. I yeah. thought maybe there's a good I'm source. I'm for beating wives. I'm talking about children. <laughs> no, I'm not for beating wives. Yeah. No, I'm not for beating I, I, uh, I think there often comes a time when a child keeps pushing, pushing. He hasn't gotten the rules clearly laid out for him, and then he needs that uh, sort of thing. So, but that's in some families, and other people say, "No, you should never touch your child. You should never do this. There are other ways to do this." But uh, everybody's different. The parents are different. The child is different, and and each child in a family, uh, you have five children. They have to be treated. Let me in ask you about ways. this theory that I read some years ago by some child psychologist and said, "If you have the room, it's an effective way to do it. When a child misbehaves." You don't hit him, you don't scream, you take him to a place like a room, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is devoid of all furniture, there's nothing to play with, and you put him in that room. <clears throat> it's a padded cell. In a way, yeah. until he, in other words, it's his doing that he's there. Mm -hmm. In other words, you have him until he can yeah. relate to other people and behave himself, mm -hmm. you leave him alone. And no matter whether he screams or kicks or has a tenter tramping, yeah. you wait. Do you it believe often, in that? Yes, it's often effective. You can get the child in the room, and if he doesn't destroy the room once he's That's in there... That's what I say. You have to have a place where he cannot do yeah. literally anything. Yeah, like these chimp pads all over the... And it's just all... Now, the, the idea is to, to remove all sorts of stimuli, because um, often the parent and the child are both angry at each other, and you have to break this up. And if you can stop and think enough to do that for the child, why it's, very, it's sort of like the, what they do with uh, hockey players. They're just, you know, 
nasty little children. You have to isolate them every once in a while. <laughs> now, but, but what I'm finding is uh, that uh, people don't need to do that with their children so much if uh, the, this thing about nutrition. Often that it's triggered by a stress thing coming at uh, their, their blood sugars drop. Here's a, a typical example that I see all the time. The child comes home from school at 3.30 in the afternoon. He's just wa uh, the, the night before he watched one of those television things where the police broke into the apartment. So he comes to the front door and, ah! and breaks open the door and he comes in. Ah! And his mother is standing there What's going to happen today? So uh, now we know what to do. So he's got his mouth open. She shoves this big gob of peanut butter down his throat, <laughs> sticks him in his room, holds the door shut while he's in there screaming and hollering. After 20 minutes, he comes out and says, Hi, Mom. What's, what can I do to help? Because his blood sugar comes up. And I, I know this happens. If, if people's blood sugar is down okay. and the mother says, uh, Good afternoon. How was school? And he goes, oh, the, oh, and he falls on the floor. But if his blood sugar is low, he, he can answer the question. It has a lot to do with it. So before you talk to anybody, be sure they've eaten. The same thing happens to me. If my wife speaks to me before I've eaten, I'm, I, she doesn't get the answer that she would deserve. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, it's always a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Book, Ruling a Child's Behavior Chemistry. I hope you come back with us often. It's Thank you. Always It's fascinating. a nice book. I, I read it every once in a while. Good. <laughs> <laughs> when there's a problem. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank You're you. heading for San Diego uh, first? Comedy Store South in San Diego, and then to Harris with Bobby Gentry. Good luck. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Good night. Have a nice week. I'm humbled by that applause.